This is Popular Front, a podcast focused on the very niche and kind of geeky details of modern warfare with me, Jake Hanrahan. Today we're speaking to Seamus Malik Afzali. He's going to be speaking about ISIS in Iran. Now, there was a recent ISIS video release and it showed some fighters inside Iran. It's not Willia, it's not like its own franchise yet but there certainly is a cell with fighters who are armed. Seamus is going to be speaking to us about what kind of threat they pose, specifically how if America gets the war that it seems to want to have with Iran, all hell could break loose on the ISIS front. He'll also be speaking about the history of Sunni Islamist militancy in Iran. Everything here at Popular Front is grassroots independent. So if you like what we're doing, please do consider supporting us. Patreon.com slash Popular Front. The other day there was um, a new release, right, from ISIS. And basically it was saying... ISIS in Iran is kind of forming their cells more formally now. They look more organized than I had seen anyway. Um, maybe you can start there. Tell us no, about this, uh, this new no video release from ISIS Iran. They're not called that though, so right? far. Um, as far as I can see, there's been no... Uh, typically, attacks are announced through uh, AMAC or through uh, Khilafa bulletins, which is how they typically release attack reports. Um this is the first that I've seen where they've officially announced themselves as being in Iran. It's part of a new cross-provincial video series called And the Best Outcome is for the Righteous. Um, it's where a bunch of different groups in different provinces so far. There's been groups in Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Egypt all of them renewing their Pledge of Allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the self-proclaimed Caliph of ISIS. This one was from Walayat Khorasan, which is primarily based in Afghanistan. It's based off of the historical name for the general region. And what was interesting about this release is that in addition to being in Afghanistan, it showed off a bunch of different renewals from places like India, Pakistan, um, and interestingly, Iran. Uh, the part of the video that came from Iran was pretty minimal. There were about four or five fighters in the room, maybe six, and one guy in the middle. It, they were talking about how Iran's actions in Yemen, Syria, Iraq were the reasoning behind why they need to be defeated and nothing else much to it other than that and the renewal of their uh, their Pledge of Allegiance. So far, other than that, nothing much to it. So it's not correct to say then maybe that there is now a uh, so-called Wiliat now in Iran of ISIS? No, there is. A, if the video is to be, if the information presented in the video is accurate, that there are ISIS fighters operating covertly in Iran in a organized fashion, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a province, that it is a wilaya. A wilaya typically has, um, at least from what it used to be during the height of ISIS days, it would have an emir, a leader, that would organize all the provincial um, dealings. There would be sometimes different departments, media apparatuses. It Typically, a uh, wilaya is something that you would see in parts of northern Iraq, Syria, where there are so many fighters, there are so many operatives, where it, it functions like an actual district, it functions like an actual province. When it's just five people, you can say that you're there, but it's nothing more than uh, a propaganda piece. You are there, but you are not really there operating as a formidable force. Maybe you can tell us then about the history of ISIS in Iran. Not like, like you said, there's not a willy out there, but there is, there has been a presence of ISIS in Iran for a while, right? Um, a while, a while is relative. There's been Islamist terrorism in Iran, Al Qaeda affiliated for many years now. But as far as I'm aware, um, there have been Iranians. There have been Iranians in ISIS longer than there has been ISIS in Iran. Um, the first ISIS attack that happened in Iran happened in 2017, uh, which was a big attack on Tehran, where there were, I believe, about three teams of attackers that attempted to 
they, the first team went after the mausoleum of Ayatollah Khomeini, where there was a suicide attack and a gun battle that surprisingly only killed one person. Uh, the second team went after the Iranian parliament while it was still in session. They killed uh, a lot of office workers and they tried to storm the actual chamber of the Iranian parliament, but surprisingly, they still kept the parliament in session while the attack was going on. Um, they were then killed by the RGC. There was a third team that got stopped, according to the RGC, before they were able to attack anyone. Uh, there were female assailants involved, and there was, an, uh, there was a video that was released by the attackers while they were inside the parliament building. Um, after that, the second attack that happened was about over a year later, uh, in Ahvaz, where three fighters who were dressed as IRGC soldiers attacked a military parade, yeah. Um, what was weird about that attack was that ISIS was not the first person to claim responsibility. Typically, around this time, whenever there was an attack that could be ISIS, even if it wasn't, ISIS would be just on, um, just on point taking responsibility. There was... An incident in France where a Muslim man stabbed his family, and ISIS immediately took responsibility for it as soon as the news of it got released, even though it was later found out that it was just a familial dispute. So ISIS not taking responsibility for this automatically was strange. If I remember right, it was a separatist group initially claimed the attack, right? Not even, uh, you know, not jihadists, just like, um, uh, you know, a nationalist separatist group. Yes, yes, the Ahwazi, or the Ahwazi separatists, as it says in Arabic, they, um, a group of them announced the responsibility for attack pretty much right away, uh, and a lot of um, Ahwazi separatists figures celebrated the attack, said that it was, um, it, it, it was a signal to the Iranian government that they were not to be, uh, that they were to be feared. However, about a day later, um, ISIS took responsibility for it, and there was this big... Um, uh, tussle over like who is really responsible. Uh, tussle over like who is really responsible for it is are the Ahwazi separatists? Uh, are they back on the scene after after a while, or is it ISIS just pulling some shit? So they, no, it's our terror attack. No, it wasn't. It was our terror attack. Yeah, because because like children children were killed in this attack. It's not something that I would be. Yeah, it's fucked up, man. Be, yeah. It's not something that I would typically want to be associated with, but then ISIS released a video um, showing their three fighters in the car before the attack. Um, two of them were Arabic speakers, one was a Persian speaker, and they're talking about, of course, you know, jihad, um, how they're going to stick it to the enemies of Islam. Um, it, it was very clearly an ISIS attack. Um, after that point... Um, there have been now. There hasn't been the same amount of time in between the previous, between the Tehran attack and the attack at Ahvaz, um, until now. But so far, there have been no attacks uh, on Iran by ISIS up until that point. This is the first um, official ISIS mention of activity inside Iran since September 2018, when that attack happened. Right, and and with this new release, what exactly were they saying they're up to? They, they weren't even saying what they were going to do, necessarily. Um, most of the speeches that were inside the video um, were talking this polemics about how the, about the crimes of the Iranian government, about uh, the crimes of the Syrian government. Nothing really specific about... Because um, in previous videos that have featured Iranians, uh, previous, previous ISIS videos that have featured Iranians, they're talking about wanting to cut throats inside Tehran. Uh, they're talking about suicide bombing society Iran, and this one, it's just, it's just talking about why Iran needs to be fought, but nothing, no specific threats, um, as far as far as um, as far as the speech by uh, the leader Abu Mujahid al Farisi uh, said. And who's he? He's the what? He runs the units in Iran. Uh, so far, at least according to the video, he's the only leader that is named. Um, the no no other fighters, as far as I'm aware, were named in it. Um, now, what's what's possible is that I there, there are two scenarios in terms of where this group came from. Either it is a homegrown uh, ISIS group in eastern Iran, um, or it is a contingent sent by uh, the Walayat Khwarasan organization in Afghanistan, uh, primarily because of two things. One. 
in February 2018, Mohsen Razai, who is an IRGC general, uh, revealed that, or you have to take IRGC's word for it though, uh, that a team from Afghanistan tried to infiltrate Iran and set up shop in areas that have been affected by earthquakes, um, which is near where uh, attacks have been um, attacks have been threatened. Uh, they weren't able to do anything, but they were sent by the original organization in Afghanistan to do that. Uh, they had a team of about 20 people. They expected to raise an army of about 100, but they were pretty uh, pretty easily uh, struck back. Um, the reason, the reason why it's speculated that they're from Afghanistan is because Abu Mujahid's accent is someone who either lives in western Afghanistan, who is from the Herat area, or he is someone who is from the Khorasan province, which is in uh, eastern, northeastern Iran. Um, either way, this is not, uh, either location of this would not be somewhere in western Iran near the Iraqi border. This is somewhere probably in Baluchistan. Uh, which is pretty rural, predominantly Sunni Muslim, lots of desert, lots of uh, places for them to just kind of hide out and wait it out. It's where a lot of Islamist groups not associated with ISIS are hiding out at the current moment. Baluchistan is in that contested area where there's a lot of separatists, or there there's two Baluchistans, no? Yes, uh, in Pakistan there is Baluchistan where there's the... Uh, all, all of their groups are named like the same thing. There's the Baluch Liberation Army, uh, currently operating in Pakistan. It's very, very hard to get there. In Sistan and Baluchistan. So not that one? No, no. Uh, in Sistan and Baluchistan, there are currently, and, I, and even when I'm saying this, those groups could be inactive by now, there is Ansar al Furkan and there is uh, Jaysh al-Adl, um, which were two splinter groups from Jundullah, which uh, in 2012, uh, near the end of the Ahmadinejad presidency, they, uh, they splintered after being targeted by the Iranian army a bunch. Um, they've been, they've been operating out of there for a while. And if ISIS is in Baluchistan right now, in Sistan and Baluchistan, they likely will not be able to be struck out from that area for a very long time, mainly because Jaysh al um, despite being constantly targeted by Iranian border troops, despite constantly being targeted by Iranian army, uh, soldiers, um, they've conducted very deadly attacks against the IRGC. There was a suicide bombing a couple months ago against a bus full of them and it killed about 29 people and so far um they haven't really been shaken by any of the actions taken by uh the iranian government since then so they've got a little fiefdom down there basically where they can just kind of you know brew up jihad quite freely yes kind of like the sinai it sounds like maybe Yes, yes, there's a good comparison. There's In the coastal areas, similar to Sinai, there's cities, there's a lot of infrastructure, but once you go out into the desert, it's, it's, uh, it's free game. There, there, there's, nothing, there's pretty much nothing out there. Uh, there's oases that you can feed from. Um, the, government, the, the administrative efficiency of the Iranian government is pretty nil. If you want to operate there, if you want to set up training camps there, if you want to operate freely and gain support that is where you want to go you're not going to be able to do that in Ahvaz you're not going to be able to do that in uh northern Khorasan in Iran um Baluchistan is the prime place to do that right well that's I, I was thinking how you know Iran is um predominantly Shia Muslim and of course ISIS are all you know hardline Sunni Muslim um or at least claim to be and how how is it that they're trying to get a foothold in Iran? Like, surely that's a hard place for people like ISIS to kind of, you know, make a mark. It, it is definitely difficult. Um, but Iran has a... It, it, it is the stereotypical villain. It is the prime final boss, as it were, in terms of the Sunni jihadi uh, terminology behind the crimes of the Syrian government, behind the Houthis in Yemen, behind Hezbollah, behind uh, you know, Hamas. The Iranian government has its hands in all of that. It sends money, it sends troops, it trains people, uh, it bombs occasionally directly, it's engaged in fighting directly on the ground in Syria, they fought ISIS directly. Um, to be on the ground in Iran, to fight against Iran directly, on its own turf, in its own borders, carries with it now of course they actually have to to sustain that but if they are able to do that that is a 
pretty significant morale victory for ISIS to have successfully expanded into a country after they've been defeated that has been at the heart of every bad thing, quote unquote, that has happened to them. Um, there was a video released in 2017, um, I believe it was in February, um, well, I could be wrong about that, sorry, March 2017, called Persia Between Yesterday and Today. It's this big, long, 40-minute video, uh, where Western Iran, where, um, Western Iranians, Western Sunni Iranians explain how Iran, since you know, the days of the Safav, not even the Safavid Empire, the Archimedes Empire, way back in the day, they've always been at the center of evil, of paganism, of everything. And in every single stage of Iran's history, from the Safavid Empire, where um, Sunnis were forcibly converted to Shiism, um, to the Shah's era, where there was so much decadence and economic strife, to um, and when the communists were in power uh, in parliament, sorry, um, to of course the Islamic Republic when Shia clerics took power, every single stage of history Iran has been a part of to ISIS is evidence of a massive unchecked evil, far greater than any other power uh, that is that is out there that they are fighting currently, other than maybe America. That's why when they talk about Syria occasionally, they will say before Nusayri, the offensive term for Alawites, that these are these are the Majusi, which is a term meaning Magian, which was the original prophetic term meaning Zoroastrian. Because in ISIS's mind, since Nuru's Persian New Year is celebrated in Iran, they're still Zoroastrians. And as they are and as they are the main empire behind all of these people. Everybody who works for them is therefore in some way Majusi. They are they are agents of Iran in that sense. Right, and then like people consider in in those areas consider Zoroastrians as like devil worshippers and all of this stuff. Uh, sort of um, tracing tracing the official ISIS line on Zoroastrians is difficult because um, it changes from speaker to speaker. Uh, Yazidis are typically the ones that are considered devil worshippers, but Zoroastrians are no less uh, contemptible and detestable as pagans are, even if the official prophetic um, methodology is to grant them jizya, is to grant them uh, the same rights that you would Jews. Christians, they are still evil, they are still um, meant to be fought uh, in this sense until they accept it. So, so they see them as heretics then. Um, so, so ISIS don't even think that they're, they're like, no, Shia isn't even a strand of Islam we disagree with. It's Zoroastrian, it's paganism. Is that what you're saying? Uh, Iran and Shiism more specifically, okay. but I think ISIS supporters would tell you still that Shiism is not Islam in any sense of the word. That's why they, when they, when they talk about Sunni fighters in, let's say the Iraqi army or the FSA, uh, they'll use the term either sahwa, which means, um, which refers to the awakening, tr the awakening troops that fought with the U.S. Army in Iraq in 2007 against ISIS, or they'll call them murtadin, apostates, meaning that once they were a part of the Sunni uh, fold, but they have since left it. When they talk about Shias, they call them murafidi, the ones who rejected, aka going way back to uh, the succession of caliphs of Abu Bakr. Ali. It's like thousands of years ago and shit. Oh, like way, way, way back in the day. Uh, so when they rejected Abu Bakr as the first caliph after uh, the Prophet Muhammad, because they rejected that and they followed Ali instead, they're, they, they're, they're really not even... They are a, To ISIS, they are a separate religion itself. And of course, there's the separate religion itself. And of course, there's there's accusations that they're actually Jews or uh... so. Where's the Jews? The Jews. They just get always always getting it in the Middle East. Always the Jews, man. Always the Jews. Always the Jews. Yeah, it, it, it's a whole thing. It's a whole. None of, none of it is based on really uh, anything consistent, but it, it's they're evil essentially. Sure. So we can say then that Iran is basically, to ISIS at least, the epicenter of that kind of thinking. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so many Shia, and, and Iranians would tell you this themselves, that Iran is the center of Shia theology, of, of Shia uh, thinking. There are so many seminaries that go out of there that are very highly regarded. There are tons of Shia clerics that operate out of there. The largest mosque, period, is located in Iran with the Imam Reza Shine. Um, it is the center of Shia thought, period. And to attack that country, to assault it, to operate inside of it within its borders is, like I said, it's a massive victory to them. It, 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 it is the, it is the, as you said, it's the epicenter of everything. You have, you have cut right to it. Do you think then that with the, uh, I kind of hate to bring this back to America, but it, you have to look at it like this at the moment with what's going on. Do you think the disruption with Trump and um, what's his name, matey with the fucking stupid moustache, um, Bolton. <laughs> yes, John Bolton. Yeah, yeah, him. yeah, him. yeah. Do you think it, though that is gonna allow ISIS inside Iran, or at least these fighters that are saying they are like ISIS Iran, to spread? Because to me, it does sound like pretty uh, a good opening for them in the worst way possible. That yes, absolutely. I would I would agree with you one hundred percent. Um, there during the Iran protests, I believe the latest spat of them was in twenty seventeen. Ansar al Furqan used the instability just caused by those protests to travel to Ahvaz and set off a bomb uh, near, I believe, an oil pipeline, um, signaling that, you know, they were kind of hoping that there would be some kind of war, some kind of insurrection that they could pounce on the back of. Um, if there were to be a war uh, or an invasion or uh, a large airstrike campaign of some kind in that area, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that groups, uh, not only just ISIS, but um, like I said, Asr al-Fulqan, uh, Jaysh al-Adl, would absolutely not only be able to increase their efficiency as groups to grow, I would say that they would probably be able to capture certain villages, certain towns, maybe not cities, considering large Shia populations that are inside of them, but they would absolutely be able to create a foothold that you know, following the war, if the war were to ever end, they would not easily be able to be cast out of back into the desert. They would be able to hold on to those areas for a very long time. Uh, the Iranian army has an extreme, the Iranian government as a whole has an extremely strong security apparatus. It's what's allowed the, there have been terrorist attacks inside Iran before then, but so far they haven't been able to, they've been able to make sure that the catastrophe that was going on in Iraq didn't spread over their borders as much as it did. Considering that even now, with that security apparatus, that groups are operating inside of their territory and committing attacks, if if the war were to happen, they could easily get in, and they would easily be able to destabilize a country even further as U.S. troops or Saudi troops or UAE troops or landing inside the country that's uh yeah that's a worrying um prospect one i don't think anybody thinks about when they're kind of like yeah let's bomb iran it's like mm, it's gonna fuck everyone um but again you know authoritarian government going on it's yeah it's it's just a big mess i think um you mentioned some of those other jihadist groups um maybe you can tell us about them because i think looking at the other sunni extremist groups in iran will probably give an idea of where isis might be headed or where they're taking recruits from you know what i mean yeah yeah um so there's there's not a ton of stuff to talk about inside of their history um but it all starts back in 1994 with the bombing of the imam Reza shrine that was the first terrorist attack that happened in Iran based on Sunni terrorism. And there was a group called the Movement of Iranian Sunnis that was that took responsibility for the attack a couple months after the fact. Um, that laid kind of dormant for a while, didn't really do anything, up until 2003 when Jundullah was established. Um, Jundullah was the first Sunni Islamic group operating, quote-unquote, for the rights of Sunnis in Iran. Um, there were there were a couple very, very deadly bombings that they undertook in the latter half of their history. Um, about, I think, like 200-some people died in one bombing of a Shia mosque uh, in Sistan and Um But after the fact, 
Iran really hammered them hard to break up the organization, and after that only did the really weird stuff start happening. Um, in 2012, they split off into Ansar al Fulkan and Harakat Ansar Iran and Jaysh al Abel. Um, people might not know who Harakat Ansar Iran were, but pretty much all they did was put out weird propaganda images. Um, there was one, there's like a gallery that I have of like 500 of them. There's one where they have Ahmadinejad smoking weed. Uh, there's one where um, they're, they're, they're one of their fighters is attacking Ahmadinejad on the moon. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, it, they, didn't have any, they didn't have anything to do. Um, as far as I can tell, Ansar al Fulkan and Jaysh al Adar were actually doing attacks. But Harakat Ansar Iran um, was just kind of putting out a lot of... They invested a lot in their social media uh, expanse trying to direct attention to them. Like <laughs> jihad shit posting. I love that. That was kind of, yeah, that was that was basically their game. Um, but then obviously they didn't really do anything, so they phased out about a year later. Um, Ansar uh, Ansar Fokan did the brunt of media work. If you compare the media output from uh, Ansar Fokan and Jaysh al Adel, it's kind of like comparing. Um, oh, this is really going to make sense. Um, to, from ISIS to the Taliban. Uh, for those who aren't really aware. Obviously, ISIS has a very, very slick, very, very um, well-produced thing. Um, there's clearly some work involved, some editing involved. With Jaysh al Adel, they just kind of put out videos uh, that were like an hour and 30 minutes long, people talking, no subtitles, um, one shot on uh, war. Occasionally, there would be combat videos that you couldn't see anything, but you could clearly tell that they were fighting somebody. We're talking like Live Leak versus Netflix, <laughs> or like Live Leak versus YouTube, yeah. With Taliban being Live Leak and ISIS being the YouTube. Yes, one, one, of, one of these groups clearly took more from Harakat and Saudi Iran's team than the other. Um, there, there was um, Ansar al Fulkan, their video output has gone down pretty significantly since 2016. I don't think they put out a video since then. But uh, a lot of it had to do with riding around in the desert, um, praying out in the open. Uh, a, lot, a lot of videos that outlined that they were there, they were in Iran. Uh, they were there fighting the Iranian regime just by being there. Um, they conducted a few attacks, but none on the scale that uh, Jundala was able to um, get, where there were hundreds of casualties and there were lots of civilian deaths that had struck a lot of fear uh, into the province. And Zara Fukan, they conducted some bombings, but they weren't really able to strike that kind of fear into people's hearts that Jundala was able to. Jishal Adel mostly focused on attacking soldiers, border guards who were um, operating inside uh, near the Pakistani border. They captured, uh, I believe, 20 of them about a year ago, and they released them a little bit later. They've been, they've been mostly effective at doing that, at fighting soldiers, while Ansar al uh, attacks infrastructure. Um, but either, either one of those groups, they didn't really do much in the way of advancing their position of trying to capture towns, of trying to do it like in West Africa, like with Boko Haram. They're not going into villages and killing people. They're just kind of staying around and bombing places occasionally. Right. And have they said anything about the, the ISIS members in Iran or do we know maybe they're getting, I don't know, maybe members have joined up or maybe they've been absorbed by the uh, ISIS cells in Iran because it sounds like the perfect match in a very grim way. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Um, the issue is that a lot of the information that we're operating on with uh, membership of Iran is in ISIS and ISIS fighters who are coming into Iran, it comes from the IRGC. And the IRGC, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, lies a lot. Um, there were, the, during the, after the ISIS attack uh, on Tehran, uh, even though public opinion was pretty firmly that ISIS was behind the attacks, even if, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia was kind of in the background there, uh, IRGC was very firm in saying that Saudi Arabia directed these attacks, they told these ISIS fighters where to go, uh, who to attack, all these things, that they were in the decision-making process the whole way through. Um, on a level that I don't think really any analyst is really considering. Um, 
and they were also talking about how Israel did it and how the United States also had a hand in it. Um, when we talk about membership figures and exact uh, ISIS plans, there are, it's it's not as high stakes in terms of needing to lie, but either way, the IRGC is not a totally trustful organization. Um, either way, everything the IRGC has set up until this point points to not other groups joining up with ISIS or pledging allegiance to ISIS, but more people sent in from other countries in order to attack and group up. Um, as far as I can tell, not from any communication from Jaishal Adil or Ansel Farkhan has there really been any mention of ISIS in Iran or the threat that they pose or the dangers of a potential uprising of ISIS in Iran. Uh, not even so much as a mention of any fighter from those organizations joining up. It's a bit of an information vacuum where you can't really tell much of what's going on, but there's a lot of media output from these organizations just in the form of maybe text posts or uh, small video clips, and nothing has come out about any of those topics as far as I can, as far as I've been able to see. Right. Well, going back to the thing we originally started talking about this this new video release. Um, why do you think they've done that now? Because like you said, they didn't really say anything. They're just like, hey, you know, we're here still. Um, why now? Because usually when they do something, there is some kind of calculated idea behind it, even if it does seem a little bit mysterious at first. Yeah, the, the whole idea behind, and I think this is where you're going towards, the whole idea behind this cross-provincial video series, all with the same title and all the same objective, is after the Battle of Balguz, when the last shred of Islamic State territory was bombed out um, pretty... Just, it was basically just bombed to glass at that point. It galvanized whatever was left of the ISIS media apparatus uh, at the far corners of the world to show that even if we were completely bombed out, um, that we're still here. Um, there's still there's still a caliphate, even if there is this is the quote unquote new stage of the jihad. Um, we're still operating. We're still it's uh, it's it's their motto, Baqiya wa uh, If I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm um, remaining and expanding. They are remaining after the Battle of Baghuz, and they are still expanding, uh, even if they haven't expanded much recently. Yeah, like they're they're expanding is like one more guy has joined in like a mountain somewhere. Yeah. Yes. That's that's the thing. <laughs> there's. Um, in, in places like West Africa, um, there, there were these gigantic groups of fighters who were all in this group, and not all of them can get into the center of the pledge. Uh, they're all in these motorcycles, and they're, they've got these, this line of soldiers ready to fight. Uh, in Sinai, they've got man pads, they've got um, rocket launchers, they've got vehicles. Uh, but then you get to places like the Caucasus, and there's two guys with an airsoft rifle... Uh, you get the Azerbaijan, and there's a guy in front of a tarp. Um, it, it, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a ton of things, but it, it's just to show that hey, uh, we have ISIS supporters in these areas. You know, we could strike at any time. And the the footage that's coming out of Iran is kind of in the middle here. Um, it's it's still one shot on. It's not a it's not um it's not a ton of fighters, but they do have real weapons. They are in a house somewhere. They do have a location, or at least a safe house, where they can, where they can be, and they are the the reason why I I'm more inclined to believe that they are sent by uh, Walayat Khorasan from people from Afghanistan is because the gear that they're wearing, um, which is uh, five eleven tactical gear, or at least fake five eleven tactical gear. This is stuff that is primarily used by U.S. soldiers or U.S. soldier-affiliated personnel in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're able to get this kind of stuff in Iran. So these are people who are likely trained by ISIS in Afghanistan, and they're sent out to these places. They couldn't even order that on AliExpress and like get it delivered, you don't think, inside Iran? I, 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 would, guess, I would guess not. Not to places like uh, Sistan and Baluchistan. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, like no postman is going out there. No, no. Um, it, it, was, it is far more likely that if we're, if we're taking the IRGC statements with a grain of salt, that these are people who are sent from Afghanistan on some sort of mission to finally set up ISIS stuff in Iran. Um, and with, and as part of that, as part of this whole thing, as I said, 
It's about proving that ISIS is still there, that, you know, they could still send, and in the case of Iran, probably, that they could still send people into your countries without you even knowing about it, and um, set up shop and direct attacks from there. And the interesting thing that I've been trying to find is that in looking up news mentions of ISIS in Iran, there's very, very, very little that I've been able to see on news media, either Persian uh, French, English, English language stuff. The only news outlet that I've been able to see that even reported on this video was Ruda. Um, Ruda English covered the fact that this happened. The uh, the Kurdish news channel. Yes, yes, they're uh, Iraq in a based in Iraqi Kurdistan. But other than that, it's been pretty under the radar. I'm sure the Iranian government itself knows about the video, but there's been no mention of it to the general public. Likely, no one else really knows about this inside of Iran. And, and that kind of proves their point, that they would be able to do this. Interesting. I mean, as, as funny as it is, the, you know, oh, well, they're, they're barely expanding. Uh, as we know, it only takes a small amount of ISIS fighters to cause a big problem, you know, even if it is inside Iran with only a few fighters here and there. Yes, um, it only, yes, um, with Ansar al-Fulqan and Jaysh al Adil, it only took a couple of their fighters to go into cities like uh, Charbahar or Zahedan or any of these number of places and bomb very important infrastructure and cause a lot of problems. And even if Sistan and Baluchistan is a province that is very rural, there are still very, very important cities, ports that are all vulnerable to people just coming out from the countryside in a car and just causing mayhem. Even if they can't capture villages and towns, they can still cause mayhem. Yeah, ISIS is just like this disease. It just doesn't go away. Um, Seamus, is there anything else you want to say uh, before we end this? I think this has been very, very detailed. It's great. Okay. Um, I don't think I really have much on the topic. Although I think that the entry in of ISIS into Iran is important, and if there is a war, it has the potential to get very, very bad. Uh, I don't want to get too alarmist, even as I say that, that it will become a massive problem. Uh, the security apparatus is fairly strong. There haven't been a ton of ISIS fighters inside of Iran that I have seen, other than that group. And... I, I can't I can't see with a country with a Shia population that is that large of mm -hmm. a group becoming a formidable force that cannot be defeated. This is very likely not going to be a huge issue for for the country. Yeah, man. Well, let's hope it doesn't get to that. Yes, <laughs> all, all this is all, all this is hoping. Duma hours. Um, Seamus, where can people get hold of you if they want to follow your work? Which I, I definitely suggest they do. Um, I am on Twitter at at Seamus underscore Malik, S-E-A-M-U-S underscore M-A-L-E-K. Uh, I have a website uh, where I list all the articles that I've done, uh, Seamus hyphen Malik com S-E-A-M-U-S hyphen M-A-L-E-K-A-F-Z-A-L-I.com. Sorry for me having... Having the most Iranian Irish name on the planet. <laughs> yes, yes, I apologize. Um, but that is where I put most of my stuff, and I would love it if you all came out and followed me. Thanks, man. No problem, thanks. That was Seamus Malik Afzali speaking about ISIS in Iran and the real threats that they pose to Iran and the rest of the region. If you like this episode, if you want to hear bonus episodes and get all sorts of other perks, go to patreon.com slash popular front. Everything we're doing here at Popular Front is grassroots, independent, so please do consider supporting us. If you don't like Patreon, go to popularfront.co slash support. There are many other ways there that you can uh, support Popular Front and keep it moving forward. This episode was sponsored by The Defence Post, as usual. Defence with an S. Go to thedefencepost.com for all your updates on the world in conflict. And also in this episode, just want to give a shout out to Joey L, Joey Lawrence, the photographer, good friend of mine, a friend of Popular Front. If you go to his website, wecamefromfire.com, he's selling this incredible photo book 
full of um, photos of his time spent with Kurdish militants in Iraq and Syria. It's a really interesting book. Joey isn't a journalist. He's not like a photo journalist. He's a portrait photographer. So a lot of these photos, it's like fine art almost. Like it's really impressive. So if you want one of those books, go to wecamefromfire.com. I definitely suggest checking it out. If you want to keep up to date with Popular Front, follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash Jake underscore Hanrahan, or follow twitter.com slash Popular Front CO, which is the same as the site. We've got the site, everything's up and running, articles, videos, all sorts. Go to www.popularfront.co. Also, we're on Instagram, instagram.com slash popular.front. And YouTube, youtube.com slash popular front. Hit bell, subscribe, all of that stuff. There is going to be a big video release coming in about two months. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because there's a lot to, to kind of put together. But yeah, youtube.com slash popular front. Be sure to subscribe, share it with your mates, all of that. Thank you so much to the following Patreons or patrons someone said to me the other day like, you keep saying patrons it's patrons whatever man yeah cool thank you very much to Adam Berg Snyder Andrew Fife, Axel Iverson Brian McLaughlin Chad Walker Dan Dunham Daniel Shearer Diana Gorbanek Emiliano Emily Molly Fletcher Tate Joanne Stocker Joel Tambusi Kay Hardy Roberts Kyle N. Payne Lawrence Abrahams, LH, Margaret Bowling, Michael Eula, Maudi Al Rashid, Noah, Ari from the Discord, Patrick Bronte, Peter McCormack, Q Ball, Russia Alakidi, Ryan Sandercock, Scartoon Music, Sebastian from the Discord, Sarushe Hawazi, Stephen Davila, Teddy, Tom Lochrin, Tony Bin, Vida Provost. Zachary Hinch and thank you very much also to Anthony Kabarek. Thank you very much. Like I said, if you want to support us on Patreon, please do go to patreon.com slash popular front. There's a lot going on there and it helps us keep moving forward. Let's just get out there, make docs, build bigger episodes, build more independent conflict media, proper independent conflict journalism. Patreon.com slash popular front. Music in this episode, the intro was by Home and the outro was by Son of Old. Go to soundcloud.com slash son dash of dash old for his music. It's good. Subscribe, like his music, reshare it, all of that.